Good morning, I'm Jean Minnick. Welcome to mine and Dennis's home again today. Um, I'd like to start this morning with the children's story. It's called Excuses, Excuses. Look what I have. It's an invitation to a party. A friend of mine is having a party and has invited me to come. Look what it says at the bottom of the invitation. Please RSVP. Do you know what that means? It's French for répondez s'il vous plaît, and that means please let me know if you're coming. It means that my friend wants me to reply to the invitation and say whether I will attend the party or not. Sometimes people who receive an invitation to a party don't want to go, so they make up excuses. Here are some excuses they might use. Oh, I've had a bad cold and I just can't seem to get over it. Um, I think we're going to visit my grandmother. We're having a test at school and I need to stay home and study. I have to go to soccer practice. Mom said I have to babysit my little brother. Making excuses isn't new. Even back in Bible times, people made excuses. Jesus once told a story about a king who threw a party, but none of the people he invited showed up for his party. In Jesus' story, the king was going to have a party for his son who was getting married. Since he was a king and this was his only son, you can imagine that it was going to be quite a celebration and it was a tremendous honor to be invited. All of the plans had been made, the food was prepared, the invitations had been sent. The day of the celebration came, but no one showed up. The king sent his servants to see where the people were and why they had not come to his celebration. The people all began to make excuses about how busy they were. The king was very upset, so he told his servants to go out into the streets and invite everybody they saw to come to his son's wedding celebration. They did exactly what the king told them to do, and the Bible tells us that the wedding hall was filled with guests. Can you guess who the king is in this story? It was God. I'm sure you know who the son was in the story. <laughs> right, it was Jesus. Jesus has sent you an invitation. You will find his invitations in here. The Bible is full of invitations from Jesus. He says, whoever is thirsty, let him come and take the free gift of the water of life. He says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. He says, let the little children come to me, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Jesus has invited us to come to him, and yet some people are still making excuses. I would like each one of you to accept his invitation. Pray, tune into worship services, read the Bible, Find out what you have to look forward to. Jesus says you don't want to miss this party. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for Jesus, your son. We thank you for his invitation to come and receive the free gift of life which he offers. We know you are preparing a place at your table just for us. We will be there. Amen. Our opening prayer is from the hymnal, um, number 661. We gather as pilgrims on a journey of faith. We come seeking the cloud of your presence as we travel the way. We come seeking your pillar of fire to light our darkness. Shine in our hearts, O oh God, with the light of your love. Make your presence known through Jesus the Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Forgiving God, 
You do not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is your steadfast love toward those who fear you. As far as the east is from the west, so far you remove our transgressions from us. Amen. At this time, um, we can receive the morning offerings. Um, when we cannot meet physically, you may continue to give tithes and offerings to continue the work of the church by mailing your monetary offerings to George Kiefer. Generous God, you gave us life. Now we give our lives back to you. We present ourselves, our work and play, our joys and sorrows, our thoughts and deeds, our gifts and resources to be used by you for the sake of all people everywhere. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If you're on one call now, then you will have gotten messages from Debbie Kiefer. Um, please keep people in prayer that she um, makes the calls about. And if you have any praise reports or any concerns, please give Debbie a call so that she can share with the congregation. Let us pray. Merciful God, your love for us makes us bold to join our prayers with all who need your help. We bring our prayers to you for those who suffer pain, for those who struggle with limits of body and soul, for those who are satisfied with less than the life for which they were created, for those who know their guilt and their need but do not know of Jesus. For those who know that they must shortly die, and for those who cannot wait to die. Come, redeeming God, take all these sufferings upon yourself and transform them. Be merciful also to us who offer these prayers, that we might enter the sufferings of others and become agents of your healing love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Um, the scripture today is from Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 through 14, and it is the parable of the wedding banquet. This parable is about both God's grace and the gratitude of those that God invites to his table. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business while the rest seized his slaves mistreated them and killed them the king was enraged he sent his troops destroyed those murderers and burned their city then he said to his slaves the wedding is ready but those that were invited are not worthy go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man who there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The message this morning is called The Guests Who Came to Dinner. 
Um, the message was actually written by John Williams III, a United Methodist pastor um, from Columbia, South Carolina. Um, I've mostly just used his words, but there are a few places where I adapted um, a few things. But I did want to give him credit. Tell me if this sounds familiar. It's dinner time. The meal is ready, but everybody is distracted. Dad is watching a ball game and cheering loud. The daughter has on her headphones attached to her device, perhaps an iPhone or a tablet. The son is busy practicing the guitar. The other son is talking to his sweetie on the phone. The other daughter is busy editing her paper, which is due tomorrow. Dinner is ready and 10 minutes have passed and mom has sent out three different invitations to come while the food is still hot. She will be very unhappy if they do not come to dinner. This parable is not about food that gets cold, nor is this parable about people who are worthy. This parable is about both God's grace and the gratitude of those that God invites to his table. Let's explore the invitation, the guests, and the genuineness of the response of those who came to dinner. How many times have you been invited to a party where there was an RSVP involved? In modern day, we call the response that, makes, that one makes to such an invitation an RSVP. As I said before, that's French for répondez s'il vous plaît which is our English way of saying, please reply. Everyone sitting here has more than likely received an RSVP kind of response request. The reason for the RSVP is to let the host of an event know how many to prepare for, a head count. It is possible that this parable might have been an extension of the parable of the wicked tenants that Dennis spoke about last week, for there seem to be very many similarities. Like the parable of the wicked tenants, there were three different responses to the target audience. Call us anything, but do not call us late to dinner, right? In verse 5, there are those who tried to make invalid excuses. One went to his farm, and another to his business. Do we ever make light of God's invitation because we're self-absorbed? If that question does not make us examine ourselves, then maybe we aren't taking it seriously enough. God did not ask us to fill out a survey about the invitation, citing the things we like and complaining about the things we don't. We are blessed just to be invited and sometimes act as if God owes it to us to invite us. If God were to give us what we truly deserve, then would we not be escorted away? What about those who got violent and rebelled against the king's authority? That is the topic of verses 6 and 7. Surely that's a literary motif to explain injustice, right? Wrong. That is the way that some people actually treat God who gives them every breath they breathe. Again, God does not owe anyone anything. The life we have been given and the time we are given for our lives are a gift that too many take for granted. Have you ever heard of Raymond Albert Kroc, better known as Ray Kroc? Ray Kroc's name is synonymous with the fast food restaurant McDonald's. How many of you have ever eaten there? I know quite a few hands are going up. Well, the truth of the matter is that Ray Kroc entered into a business relationship with the original founders of McDonald's. Although Ray was a business entrepreneur, he was also a conniving deal breaker who took the concept and the name of McDonald's away from its creators. Check out the movie called The Founder to see the history of how McDonald's really came into existence. That kind of hostile takeover is possible between humans in a business world, but it is absolutely impossible between humankind and our creator. How many of us are willing to risk being thrown into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth? Why did the original guests neglect their invitation? The original guests represented the Jews. 
Jesus came to his own people, and his own people would not receive him. Did they reject Jesus because they felt that God did not meet them on their terms? Or was it that they preferred doing their own will to God's will? Before we condemn them or write them off, we must ask ourselves what we are doing in God's will versus our own will. Isn't it God's will for us to reach out to the last, the least, and the lost? Remember that God invited you to his table. Are we biding our time as we make light of that invitation? The new guests. What did the new guest list look like? They were outsiders by faith, culture, and social class. They were people like Matthew, Zacchaeus, the Samaritan woman at the well, the Syrophoenician woman, the woman caught in adultery, lepers, the Roman centurion of great faith, and others. Do we follow the advice of verse 9 and invite everyone? The new guests were extended an invitation that they would never have expected. Both the good and the bad were invited to the wedding hall until it was filled. They were invited from the streets and the street corners. They were sinners in need of a savior. Unlike the original guests, they were sinners, but they knew it. Matthew 9, 12 says, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Romans 3, 23 says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Paul echoes a point that Jesus made in this parable. Galatians 3, 28 says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So although they were sinners and Gentiles, they did not insult the king as the original guests had. Are we filling God's house with those we invite as verse 10 mentions? Or are we neglectful because of how we are rebelling against God's love instead of sharing his love with others? If God is inclusive, and he is, then how well do we resemble his ways as his children if we rebel against his love? Do we forget that we are stewards in God's kingdom, acting like we are owners instead? Doesn't God love the red and yellow, black and white? Are we not all beggars at the feet of Jesus who gives us far better than we deserve? What should our guest list look like? Consider this story in answering that question. A widow who moved to a small New England town did an unusual thing to celebrate her birthday. She and her husband had retired to the charming looking quaint place after vacationing in the area for over 20 years. But the husband died a couple of years after settling in the new place. Although they had often joked at the way they were still regarded by the townspeople as summer folk, the woman had not been aware how rigid the carrier was until she was left alone. True, she knew most of the town's inhabitants as acquaintances and was treated politely. But she realized that because she had not been born in the place, she was simply not one of them and not accepted. She knew that she was not deliberately excluded. It was a case of just never being included. Her birthday came again. Instead of moping, the lonely, instead of moping in lonely isolation, knowing that no one would know or care, she imaginatively decided to do something novel. She would throw a party and she would invite the people whom she could never think of inviting. Instead of inviting the people everybody thought about, the right people, this woman carefully thought about those whom she would not invite under the usual circumstances. She chuckled to herself as she began to put together her unusual guest list. There was the dark-skinned Portuguese woman with such broken English at the bakery. 
a blind woman whose family had all moved out of town and seldom contacted her. The new young school teacher in town, too shy to make friends. That divorcee with two kids who came to town from the city, lived on welfare, and was the topic of great gossip among the respectable housewives. There was another mother and widow who everybody knew had a drinking problem. And there was the wife of a new man in charge of the Coast Guard station out on the point. Who would ever have thought of including them? Our friend put them on her invitation list and they all came. Everyone had the best time in years. In fact, they agreed that they would meet again the following month in the tiny house of the Portuguese woman. Doesn't this story give us a mirror image of God and what he intended to do in filling his wedding hall with guests? And now we're going to talk about the attire. Rebecca said this was kind of a troublesome part of the scripture that I read this morning. There are social customs or habits in every culture. In this parable, Jesus addressed one of those customs. It was the custom of the host to provide adequate garments for his guests to wear at the feast. The garment that the guest provided was necessary because a guest would not be seated without it. That was the custom. Jesus used this custom in this parable as a metaphor for imposters. What was the topic of the metaphor that Jesus implied in wearing the wedding garments? The metaphor here is repentance because it is through Jesus Christ that we are justified. And there was this one man who was not justified in his presence at the table of the wedding feast because he was not wearing the proper clothing. Galatians 3.27 says, For all of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. Are there imposters at the table? Another story. As it was sinking, the Titanic's Captain Smith gave the order to members of his crew to watch out for the women and children. It was obvious that he meant women and children should be the first in the lifeboats. Though accounts differ, the story is told of Daniel Buckley, a third-class passenger on the Titanic who disguised himself as a woman so he could get on board of one of the lifeboats. In our world, we call those kinds of people imposters. God knows who the imposters are and the pretenders. If you're not clothed with the salvation of Jesus Christ as your wedding garment, then you will be cast out. It is the clothing of Christ that makes us righteous. Christ gives us his righteousness in exchange for our sinfulness. So that when God looks at us, he sees Christ and not our sin. For God cannot bear to look at the sight of sin, which is why God turned his face away from Jesus on the cross as Jesus said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God has provided the wedding garment that we need through Jesus Christ. If God is already providing the clothing of righteousness through Jesus Christ, then why is it that not everyone puts on his clothing? We cannot be admitted without it. Our righteousness is filthy rags. God makes us righteous through Jesus Christ. Amen. And now our benediction. Gentle God, you have come near to us and have shown us your patience, compassion, and love. As we go, O oh God, give us patience when people are indifferent to your word. Give us compassion for the needs of the world. And give us love which reflects your forgiveness and grace through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen.